Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we are together once again to talk about the Siddiq. And alhamdulillah, we haven't even got to the, the him being the caliph yet. Um, I think that it's important for us to understand who he was as a person before he became the caliph. And then it becomes very easily understandable that when he, when we get into the part of him being the caliph as to why the Sahaba um, were okay overwhelmingly with Abu Bakr becoming the leader of the Muslims after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there were things in which uh, we talked about Abu Bakr's character uh, as far as him not ever worshiping idols, him not drinking alcohol, he and the Prophet Sallallahu had a lot of things in common prior to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi knowing that he was the Messenger of Allah, being made aware. And um, it was a question that was asked on how they met. And the, uh, the information is that they were neighbors, pretty much. They became close after the marriage of Khadijah Rilata Anha, who was the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so therefore they were like neighbors and they had a lot in common and they became like the best of friends during that particular time. So uh, what happened is uh, we talked about the um, unwavering support that Abu Bakr gave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as far as uh, how he got his name as Sadiq. Um, it was during the time of Isra and Miraj when the Prophet Sallallahu took the night journey and the ascension. And there were people whose faith was tested by this because they were saying that the Prophet Sallallahu went on a night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and then ascended to the heavens all in one night. And when they tried to make fun of the Prophet Sallallahu like he was crazy, Abu Bakr had stuck by him and said that if you told me something that was even more magnificent than that, I would believe it. So. Um, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would take a lot of Abu Bakr's opinions, um, over a lot of other people's, he would listen to other opinions and the opinion of Abu Bakr held a lot of weight with him. Um, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had made him the Emir of, uh, going to Hajj after the conquest. They had went and they performed the Hajj and he placed Abu Bakr. And this is around the time when Surah Tuburaa or Surah Tawba was revealed, in which this is the only ver the surah in the Quran that doesn't start off with Bismillahi Rahman Rahim, because Allah wanted the Kufar to understand that this was strictly business, that this uh, the the foundation being laid, that there was no more um, idolaters um, going to be allowed to come into Mecca during that particular um, to perform the 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 Hajj. And the thing about them being naked and all of that stuff was over and done with. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, we talked about um how we ended as um Abu Bakr had uh said something. Um uh, he, he basically he punched this Jew who had said something that was derogatory about Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to the defense of Abu Bakr in a verse in the Quran, and that's where we left off. So alhamdulillah, um, one of the things that he was also known for was preserving the secrets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there was a situation with his daughter Hafsa. She becomes a widow, and Umar uh, ibn al-Khattab wanted to marry her. And, um, or, or, I'm sorry, uh, it was Umar's daughter that um, became a widow and he wanted her to get remarried and so he searched for people so he went to um he went to uthman and uthman had um he he turned her down and then he went to abu Bakr, and abu Bakr remained silent and it really made umar upset because he basically thought anybody knows that when it comes to dealing with your children, that uh, that's a sensitive situation, especially if you're trying to get them married and it seems like they're being rejected. 
And so they had became quiet. And Abu Bakr later tells him, he says, listen, you know, I was okay. I would have been okay with, with marrying uh, Hafsa, but the Prophet Sallallahu had made some um, inquiry or some interest in marrying her. And I didn't want to disclose the secrets of the Prophet Sallallahu So that was something, uh, uh, a characteristic that Abu Bakr had um, as far as keeping the secrets. And this is another thing too. You got to remember something. Um, when we're talking about these classes and we're talking about the Sahaba, we're talking about emulating their behavior and their characteristics. So this is not just something that is only known for them to do, right? So as it relates to the example that we take, that when we have a secret that's been, um, somebody's told us a secret, a friend of ours told us a secret, then we should hold that near and dear and then we shouldn't go out broadcasting what somebody told us a secret. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah said that when the Prophet Sallallahu was once delivering the Friday sermon, a caravan of goods remained, I'm sorry, ar arrived in Medina and the companions of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu raced towards it until it was only 12 men that remained with the Prophet Sallallahu And then Allah reveals a verse from the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajim. And when they see some merchandise or some amusement, beating of tambours or drums, um, they disperse headlong into it uh, and leave you standing while delivering the Juma religious talks. So the Prophet Sallallahu is in the middle of giving Juma. They see these goods coming and they run out of Juma to go see what's going on with these goods. So Allah says, say that which Allah has is better than any amusement or merchandise. And Allah is the best of providers. So Alhamdulillah, one of the things also we have to remember is that Islam is still new. So this is not like they're, they're learning kind of as they go along. So Allah is telling us this is why we don't break out in the middle of Jumu'ah, why the Imam is giving the khutbah and there's a certain type of level of um, decorum that we have when we're during Jumu'ah. So it says that among the 12 who remain firm in the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi were Abu Bakr and Umar. So they, um, did what was right. The other people got up and started running towards his merchandise and they're the ones that stayed there. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had um, uh, uh, confirmed uh, as far as what they did was the right thing. So Abdullah ibn Umar related that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is the hadith about a person dragging their um, garments out of conceitedness. And um, uh, and so Abu Bakr was concerned because remember we said that Abu Bakr had a, a frame. He was not a big person. You know, he was, he was thin. And so anybody who wears an Izar knows that when you wear the Izar, you wrap it around your waist, that it has the ability to sometimes be uneven. And so Abu Bakr was concerned about that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told him that he didn't wear his stuff out of conceit. <laughs> so, um, in the course of events that took place, Abu Bakr um, was forced for the very first time to break an oath. So Aisha Rilata Anha said, verily Abu Bakr never broke an oath until Allah revealed the decree that there is an atonement that one may make when one breaks an oath. So Abu Bakr Rilata Anha later said, um, he later said, if I ever took an oath to do something or avoid doing something and later saw another course of action which was better, I would take the better course of action and I would make an atonement for breaking my oath. So this is regarding um, a, a situation where he said that he would never eat um, the food of his guests. So some people came to his home and they were eating and he was like, you know, he was being a host. So he wanted them to eat, but he wouldn't eat. And he realized that it was better there's, uh, you know, that people kind of felt a certain type of way that he wasn't eating with them. And so he felt that it was better to eat with his, his guest. So this is something that Abu Bakr used to do too. So on a journey during which, um, this is a situation with Aisha uh, Re'ilata Anha. And the, what the author points out is that even something that turned, it, turned out to be, um, uh, at the time, it didn't look favorable. That, it, that even at the hands of Abu Bakr's family, his family was so blessed 
that even a situation that wasn't favorable at the time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bought barakah from it um, as a result of it. So this is a situation where they were, Aisha Raylata Anha is talking about um, this when they went on a journey and she accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what happened is that she, a, a necklace of hers, it broke off. And so she had informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about it. And the Messenger of Allah and a bunch of other companions went looking for this necklace. And they looked for it so long, they were in a place that there was no water. And they couldn't, and it was time for Salah. None of them could perform ablution. And so they were really upset about this. The Sahaba were upset about this. So they go to Abu Bakr and they said, listen, do you see not what Aisha Ta'ana, has done? She forced the messenger of Allah and everyone else along with him to stop here and search for a necklace. Meanwhile, there's no water source here and we don't have any water with us. So Abu Bakr took, he went directly towards uh, his daughter. And when he reached her, it said that the Prophet Sallallahu was sleeping in, the, in her lap. And um, he said, you held back the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and everyone else at a place that doesn't have any water. And to make matters worse, we don't have any water with us. So it said that Abu Bakr kept going on, uh, kept going off on her to the point where he started poking her waist. And he said the only thing that prevented her from moving was that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was resting on her lap. And um, so the Messenger of Allah continued sleeping until the morning and uh, when it was time to make uh, um, wudu for, for Salatul Fajr, um, there was no water for him to make wudu. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the verse in the Quran about tayammum. So perform tayammum with clean earth. So because of this situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us that when we don't have any water, that we can use earth in order to make what's called tayammum um, when we don't have any water. OK, so this revelation was a great blessing from Allah that guided the Muslims as another easy alternative and standard for ablution situation where there was no water available. So it says recognizing this great blessing, Usaid uh, Ibn Hudayr, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, said to Abu Bakr, this is not the first blessing that has occurred at your hands or your family. Aisha uh, later said that we sent forth the camel <laughs> and upon it was seat when we they sat up when they got up from the camel the necklace was under the camel so mashallah so this is a decree from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to bless the muslims with a, a better alternative as it relates to um when we don't have any water as to what we should do so it's established to an authentic hadith that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would forbid um, the companions from arguing with Abu Bakr and from harming him in, in any way whatsoever. So it says Abu Darda, may Allah be pleased with him, described how one day he was sitting with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he saw Abu Bakr approaching from a distance and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could tell that Abu Bakr was upset. Uh, so he says that Abu Bakr gave him salams and he said, oh, messenger of Allah, Umar al-Khattab and I disagreed about something and I was quick to say something to him that I immediately regretted. So he said some words and he immediately regretted that he said to, 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 uh, to Umar. So he said he asked Umar to forgive him, but Umar refused to forgive him. And uh, so he said, this is what I'm coming to you for. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, oh, Abu Bakr, he said it three times, may Allah forgive you, Abu Bakr. So when Umar, he regretted his role in the argument. And he went to Abu Bakr's house looking for Abu Bakr. And he wanted to make, he wanted to reconcile whatever argument that they had with each other. And Alhamdulillah, you know, brothers and sisters, once again, the Sahaba to us are like superheroes. But these types of stories, it, it, it shines light on the fact that they were human beings and that they had struggles and they got into arguments because this is not the first time that Umar and Abu Bakr got into an argument with each other. And uh, Surah to Hujra, they had, they had a, a disagreement about something to the point where they started raising their voices at each other. So what happens is that he goes and he looks for Abu Bakr. He's not at the house. 
So he puts it, he knows in his mind, like, okay, he's with, he, he got to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's going to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's going to tell him about this argument. And I know he's going to tell him that he asked for forgiveness and I didn't forgive him. And, I, and, this, and I'm risking the displeasure of the, Allah's messenger because he knows the status in which Abu Bakr has um, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, it's like this. You think about it. Our parents, um, there's there's special people that we have in our parents' lives that we know. Our parents may have friends, but we know that there's that there's one particular friend that holds weight with all of the other friends that we're very careful not to offend. They might be able to say stuff to us that nobody else could say. You look at them like an aunt or an uncle or something like that. So the, so Abu Bakr was very close with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and everybody knew the status in which Abu Bakr held with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's not like Abu Bakr was a horrible person. Like he was using his this, this relationship and was committing all kind of atrocities. He was nothing like that at all. So Abu, so Abu, uh, um, so Omar goes and he says, you know, um, <laughs> you know, he's feeling regretful for what he did. And it says, as he approached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Umar could not have been unaware of the fact that the messenger of Allah's face was, was angry. Okay. So he said, looking back and forth between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and Umar Abu Bakr, he said, he felt sorry for Umar and his pity towards Umar. He regretted for um, having spoke harshly. So he said he got, you know, kind of um, got on his knees and kind of like, you know, got in front of the Prophet said, Ya Rasulullah. I'm, I'm, it's my fault. You know what I mean? He took responsibility and he says that he was more wrong than Umar. You know what I mean? And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa makes a statement, not just to Umar, but this is particular to all the companions. He says, verily, when Allah sent me to you, you said to me, you are lying. Meanwhile, Abu Bakr said to me, he has spoken the truth. In addition to that, he comforted me and helped me with his self and his wealth. So for, uh, for, so for my sake, will you not leave my companion alone? So this is a nice way of telling him, listen, you know, this is my man. You know what I mean? He was with me. And even Omar was used to be a persecutor of Muslims. So a lot of them who had accepted Islam were not like Abu Bakr. So he says, you know, for my sake, you know, be, be nice to Abu Bakr. Don't be rough on Abu Bakr. You understand what I'm saying? So to emphasize the point, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he repeated it um, for the second time. And that's what ended up happening. So there's another situation with an individual by the name of Rabia al-Aslami. And this was over a plot of land. And he gave, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had given this other plot of land to Abu Bakr. So they, they kind of shared um, they, their properties was next to each other. So they had this disagreement because it was a date palm tree. And Rabia was like this on my property. Abu Bakr said, no, it's on my property. And then they end up getting into like a argument. And Abu Bakr says some stuff. He um he said something to him that wasn't that was uh wasn't nice. And he immediately reg regretted it. So he goes to, to Rabia and he says, Listen, say say it back to me so we can be even. So subhanAllah, this is something that who else would do something like this? So he says, look, I, I, I offended you. I want you to say it back to me so we could be even. And so Rabia was like, nah, I'm not saying nothing back. And so Abu Bakr, he gets upset and he's like, listen, you know, I'm going to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and complaining, you know what I mean, about this situation. So um, Abu Bakr, declared that he was giving up his right to the disputed land. So he like, look, you know what? I offended you. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I want you to say the same thing to me. And matter of fact, it's not my palm tree. It's yours. You can have it. MashaAllah. So he goes to, um, to he said he's going to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Rabia goes behind the messenger. I mean, I'm sorry, goes behind Abu Bakr. So um, Rabia's clans, uh, his, his tribesmen, they're following behind them. So they know what's going on. And they says, may Allah have mercy on Abu Bakr. 
he was the one who said something inappropriate to you. And why is he asking the messenger of Allah for help against you? And Rabia replied, do you not know who this is? This is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the second of the two in the cave and the most eminent of all of the Muslims. So beware, do not let Abu Bakr see you taking my side against him, for he might become angry as a result. Then he will go to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who will become angry because of Abu Bakr's anger. Then Allah, the possessor of the might and, ma and majesty will become angry because of their anger. And as a result of that, Rabia uh, will be destroyed. So his fellow clansmen, and what do you want us to do? He said, man, go back. So what he's understanding, and this is another thing for us to understand, the way that Abu Bakr had with the Sahaba, they understood his position. And alhamdulillah, what's beautiful about Abu Bakr, he, some people will become arrogant about this. Some people would be nasty with this. Abu Bakr was nothing like this, okay? And so he said, look, <laughs> because sometimes we see that, right? We will see if there's a situation that's brewed and you by yourself, and then you say your cousin, your aunt pull up, your uncle pull up, this person pull up, and now the person who's looking is like, oh, oh, okay, they they on some other stuff. So Rabia was like, nah, 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 nah. Go ahead, go, I'm gonna deal with this by myself because you're getting ready to make a situation worse than what it, it what it could be, okay? And so it says he followed Abu Bakr all by himself. And when the two of them reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr gave an account of what happened. And when Abu Bakr stopped talking, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raised his head towards Rabia and said, oh Rabia, what, was, uh, what has happened between you and Abu Bakr as Siddiq? Now, SubhanAllah, this is the beauty, one of the beautiful things about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is about being just. He didn't take Abu Bakr's word because that's what Abu Bakr said. Even though Abu Bakr holds this position, he holds this status, all of the Muslims were equal. And so he goes to, they, to plead the case. Abu Bakr says what he says. And then he says, and, and the Prophet Sallallahu is listening. And then he raises his head up and says, Rabia, so what happened? What, what's going on? What's your thing with Abu Bakr? So Alhamdulillah, this talks about, and this is something once again, that we need to take from the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because sometimes people have the tendency to be more swayed by people who they cool with. If somebody is cool with you, you might be a little bit biased or you have a family member, you might be a little bit biased. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't like that. And you know, just as an offshoot, there was a situation where a woman had stole something and they had went, the, the tribe had went to Usama bin Zayd because they understood the love and the position that Usama had with the Prophet Wasallam in order to intercede to get her out of this punishment of getting her hand chopped off, right? And so what happens is, is that the Prophet Wasallam came upset with, with Usama for even coming to him about that. And he said, I swear by Allah that if my daughter Fatima had stole, that I would cut her hand off too. So this is the justice in which the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam had did. And this is the same justice that we should do as it relates to whatever. If our children, if our mother, our father, whoever, we have to be just because we're going to stand up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day and be held accountable for what we did. So it says, he, he said that, um, Rabia gave a similar account to what Abu Bakr had said. And Abu Bakr said something to me quickly and he regretted it. And then he said to me, say um, to me what I said to you. And uh, he said, I refuse to do that. <laughs> I refuse to do that, Prophet Islam. And so the Prophet Islam said, yes, indeed, you shouldn't have did that. He told him, he said, instead, and alhamdulillah, once again, here's another lesson for us. He said, instead, say, may Allah forgive you, O Abu Bakr. Okay? So instead of us coming with a similar insult, somebody said something foul to you, and you say something foul, foul back, if you're trying to forgive them for what they said, don't say nothing foul back to make your situation equal. He, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us a better way. And he says, say, or Rabia say, may Allah forgive you, Abu Bakr. And then uh, Rabia said, may Allah forgive you, Abu Bakr. Alhamdulillah. 
And it said that when after even after the situation, Abu Bakr went away crying because this is somebody who is consistently worried about his standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so even after the situation had come, even after he was asked for forgiveness, he was so remorseful that he walked away from that situation in tears. So to be sure, um, he didn't cuss any uh, any other vile words. And this is not the, um, the, the uh, character of Abu Bakr. So it's not something that, especially towards a Muslim, it was something that he, it was probably something he was so hyper vigilant about not dis, uh, displeasing Allah that it could have been something to us that might have been kind of minor, but to Abu Bakr it was huge because he was not a person who would use profane language even before he um, had accepted Islam. That wasn't his character. So it says that um, it was just harsh what he said. It probably was borderline harsh, and he had a, a um, had, had regret from doing that, and so. It says that when Rabia refused, he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he asked for Abu Bakr's forgiveness and the matter was then concluded. And Abu Bakr continued to feel remorse and he cried. And most people, <laughs> they forget when they commit major sins, they forget about it. They might not even ask Allah to forgive them for it, but they forget about it. And this is something that Abu Bakr was very um, keen on, not displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Huraira <clears throat> reported that one day the messenger of Allah sallallahu wasallam said to his companions, who amongst you has woken up this morning with the intention of fasting? And Abu Bakr said me. Then the prophet sallallahu wasallam asked, who among you has accompanied a funeral procession? Abu Bakr said me. The prophet sallallahu wasallam, who among you has fed a poor person a day? Abu Bakr said me. The Prophet وسلم, said, and who among you has visited a sick, per a sick person today? And Abu Bakr said, me. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, finally said, whenever these performances of these deeds are combined in a person, then it is a means that that person will enter paradise. So alhamdulillah, you can see the ibadah and the, the character of Abu Bakr as it related throughout his whole day was filled with all, all of these things, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we know that attending somebody's janazah is a, also a form of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and there's a great amount of barakah in, um, in doing so. We know the barakah in terms of feeding people and visiting the sick and so on and so forth. Each one of those things that he did by themselves had a great amount of reward. And alhamdulillah, he was able to do all of these things in one particular day. And so it says Abu Bakr was generous towards everyone, but particularly towards his relatives. And so there's a situation with a person by the name of Miss, uh, Mista Ibn Utha, Utha, Uthatha. And this is a relative of his who had no means of earning any income. And so Abu Bakr, you know, we used to provide for him and stuff like that. So the, the relationship ends up changing because this situation with Aisha Raylata Anha, this scandal and these lies that was told on Aisha Raylata Anha comes to uh, 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 um, comes to fruition. And so the chief of Medina's hypocrites, Abdullah Ibn Ubay, he starts this rumor about Aisha doing some wrong. And unfortunately, you had Muslims who had got involved in this in this scandal, and um, you know the the hypocrites of Medina. Okay, so we've talked about this in the stories of the prophet, uh, um, st the story of the prophet, sorry, Salam, the Sira. The hypocrites were people whom accepted Islam verbally, but in their heart they hated Islam. And when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had come to Medina. Islam was such a strong force because now the two tribes that had been fighting each other for so long, the Aus and the Khazraj, were not at, at odds with each other anymore. So it was uh, they had to do things underhanded. They couldn't fight the Prophet wasalam, like in his face. So they would do things in, turn, in order to try to undermine any time, any crack, any opportunity, they would um, co consort with the Jews, they would consort with Ghatafan, they would consort with the Quraysh, anything they would try to do in order to destroy Islam from within. 
And so Abdullah ibn Ubay is the chief of all of these people who are Allah talks about al munafiqeen and these types of people Allah said will be in the lowest depths of the hellfire. And so this individual came up with this accusation of Aisha doing some wrong, all of the other munafiks, they got involved in this situation, these hypocrites, they got involved and unfortunately subhanallah you had some right some some good muslims who got involved in this too. And this is another example brothers and sisters in Islam. You know alhamdulillah we can get caught up in stuff um, and it could really cause us some damage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the pest is the one that pay, minds his own business. The proof of a Muslim sincerity is that which he pays no heed to what's not none of his business, right? And so therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had other sahaba that when the news had come to them, they say put a good spin on this. Aisha wouldn't do anything like that. Is you crazy? I'm not talking about that. And we're not going to talk about that no more. We're not going to do that. But there's, uh, there's other Muslims, and we know, they get involved in gossip. And they get involved in gossip sometimes can turn into slander because you're talking about what's it's backbiting, but you're talking about something and you might accuse somebody of something that they didn't even do. And then you tell this person and you tell this person, this person tell this person. It's good for us to try to mind our own business and we need to be concerned about our own faults. Okay? Don't worry about other, other people's faults. We got enough of our own to work on those. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, had, of course, uh, 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 clarified Aisha's innocence. And so Abu Bakr had taken a position like, I'm not ever, ever doing nothing for Mr. again. He can forget that. I'm not doing nothing. He was, he was part of that scandal. He was part of that slander. I'm not doing nothing for him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this verse in the Quran. He says, uh, billahi min shaitan regime, and let not those among you who are blessed with graces, got money and wealth, swear not to, to give any sort of help to their kinsmen. Al uh, 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 masakin, the poor, and those who left their homes for Allah's cause. Let them pardon and forgive. Do not love, do you not love that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is all forgiving and most merciful. So alhamdulillah, this was a, a, a reprimand to Abu Bakr for taking his position. And when he heard this, he said, indeed, by Allah, I do love that Allah should forgive me. And he um, not only forgave Mr., he continued to spend on him as he had done before. And he even said, by Allah, I will never stop spending on him. And the implications of the verse were clear to Abu Bakr. If he forgave others, for their misdeeds in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him in the hereafter. And brothers and sisters, that takes a lot of iman sometimes. <laughs> because people do some stuff and it, you have to really do some soul searching if you're going to forgive them or not. But alhamdulillah, Abu Bakr, when it came to dealing with his relatives, he understood this and he reneged on what he had said because of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said this in the Quran and by forgiving others it can open up the door for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us so we hear Abu Bakr um you know as far as being around the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did have a job and he did earn money and he did have a lot of wealth so alhamdulillah he would go to Asham and this is um Syria and the surrounding areas. This is what they would they, this is what they would be called. And it said during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would make business trips to Basra. And um he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he Abu Bakr loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a great deal and wanted to spend time with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he had to get his money too. He had to, you had to earn your living, you had to get his money so he couldn't sit around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all the time. But he said that um, that they was resigned as far as this was the, his his journey established the importance of earning a living. Okay, so to brothers and sisters, especially brothers who are so pious that you don't think you should have a job, <laughs> you should sit in the mosque all day and worship Allah subhanahu wa taala. Earning a living is a part of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa taala as well. Uh, Halal the um, earning, by the way. Okay. 
So this is something that, and I, I put this in here because of the fact that even though all of these great qualities, all of this time that Abu Bakr was spending with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did have a job and he did have a business and it was extremely successful and you have to earn a living. And also he was, he, he was able, this is how he was able to give all, a lot of his wealth in terms of feeding people and taking care of the poor. It was because he had a, a thriving, successful business as a tradesman. And so, alhamdulillah, there was a situation one time when um, the people of Banu Hashim, he, they visited Asma, and this was his wife. Um, he was married to her at the time. And so, um, when Abu Bakr entered, he saw them, and he hated the fact that they was with his, they was chilling, you know, they was in his bait, chilling with his wife. So, he informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what had happened, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam declared uh, Asma's innocence you know in the matter and then the prophet sallallahu had got up and delivered a, a, a khutbah where he said after this day let no man enter upon a woman whose husband is absent unless he has with him other men or two other men okay so this is something in terms of people could attest you know somebody chilling in the house you know, with your wife, they're not married, so on and so forth. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this is not cool, okay? So if you're going to do that, somebody's going to come visit, then it needs to, number one, you should get permission. And then number two, it should be a situation where you're not alone like that. So this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. And then Allah says, but for him who, the true believer, um, uh, the true, uh, but for him who the true believer of Islamic monotheism fears uh, the standing before his Lord, there would be two gardens in paradise. So, without a doubt, Abu Bakr feared Allah subhanahu wa taala a great deal. And it says Muhammad ibn Surin said, with the exception of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was no individual more fearful than Allah than Abu Bakr. And it says Qais said, I once saw Abu Bakr holding the edge of his tongue. And all the while saying, this is what has placed me in so many difficult situations. And we know we have to be careful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has warned us to be careful with what, 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 what's in between our two hips in terms of our private parts and on our jawbone. You know, we have to be careful in terms of protecting those things from committing sins. So, um, so it says that he loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than any other companion. And Amr uh, uh, bin Aus, he reported, he asked the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one time, who amongst you is the most loved to you? He said, Aisha Raylata Anha. And then he said, among men, he responded, her father. And who was next? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Omar ibn al-Khattab, after which he went on enumerating a number of other um, companions. So Amr, I guess, continued to keep asking them and he kept going down the, the, the line. So this famous hadith, from, uh, this is from Abu uh, Musa al-Ashari, and he related that one day he performed ablution in a house, after which he went out and he said to himself, this day I'm going to remain with the, uh, and adhere closely to the company of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he went to the masjid, he saw that the prophet was not there. So he's told that the prophet وسلم, had left a short while ago and having been informed about it, which direction the prophet was heading towards, Abu Musa went out to look for him and he caught up with him just as he was about to enter this particular enclosed area inside which um, there was a well that was situated there. So Abu Bakr, I'm sorry, uh, Abu Musa, he sat at the gate and he waited until the Prophet Sallallahu had had finished relieving himself and then he performed wudu. And he then went inside and extended the greetings of peace to the Prophet Sallallahu who was seated along the edge of the structure with his legs hanging down inside of the well. Returning to the gate, Abu Musa said, today I will be the gatekeeper for the Messenger of Allah. So he's on, he's on guard. When after a short while Abu Bakr came and pushed open the gate. Abu Musa asked, who is it? Abu Bakr identified himself and Abu Musa said, oh, messenger of Allah. He said, hold on a minute. He <laughs> told Abu Bakr, hold on. After which he went inside and said, oh, messenger of Allah, here's Abu Bakr asking permission to enter. 
So the Prophet وسلم, replied, grant him permission and give him glad tidings of paradise. Abu Musa returned to the gate and um and the messenger of Allah um gives you permission and he told you give you the glad tidings of paradise and he entered inside the enclosed area and Abu Bakr sat down to the right of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he too extended his legs so that they were hanging down inside the well so he's doing what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is doing and then a narration goes on to mention how Umar and then Uthman came and also visited the Prophet for a short while after the um thereafter. And then in another hadith, Abu uh Huraira reported that the Messenger of Allah said that whoever spends two of the same thing in the path of Allah will be invited from the gates of paradise as follows. O oh, sir, O oh, slave of Allah, this is uh this is good. Whoever is from the people of the prayer will be invited to the gate of prayer. Whoever is from the people of jihad will be invited to the gate of jihad. And whoever is from the people of fasting will be invited to the gate of fasting. Now, whosoever is from the people of charity, they will be invited from the gate of charity. And Abu Bakr asked, is there anyone who will be invited from uh, of all of those gates? And the Prophet Wasallam said, yes, I hope that you will be one of them, O Abu Bakr. Alhamdulillah. Um, so, Abu Bakr was the most superior of the Prophet's companions. And the fact is well known, like I said, by every Muslim and to the scholar and to the layman, the young and the old. The average Muslim might be surprised is that um, one of the things that Abu Bakr had a, a thing about, he was very good with the fiqh of zakah. And honest uh, narration from Abu Bakr regarding it is the most reliable of all narrations that deal with this particular topic. Throughout the centuries, people have been trying to get, or, or when they come up to these rulings, it's been based upon the uh, the ruling and the understanding of Zakat from Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr issued a number of legal rulings, and not a single one of them was contrary um, to the Quran, to the, to the, uh, to the revealed text so it says it's recorded it's not recorded anywhere that he made a mistake in any legal um, ruling and it said that what was amazing is his knowledge about the prophet's implicit trust and his capability as a jurist was that abu Bakr issued legal rulings even in the presence of the prophet and when he would issue such rulings the prophet would confirm the correctness of them that which as have already seen and what has occurred already, Abu Qatada shares as it relates to when it breaks down the share of the um, the, the war um, booty, okay? So the Messenger of Allah once saw in a dream that attested to the profound knowledge of Abu Bakr. And Abdullah ibn Umar reported that the Messenger of Allah said, it, uh, it was as if I was being given a large, um, filled glass of milk. I drank I drank from it for, until it became full. Then I saw that milk flowing through my veins between my skin and my flesh. Some milk was still left in the container and I gave it to Abu Bakr. The companions said, O Messenger of Allah, this is knowledge that Allah has given to you. And when you have filled with it, that, and some and, and some amount was still left over, you gave it to Abu Bakr and the Prophet وسلم, said, you are correct. You have correctly interpreted my dream. On the other area of particular interest, Abu Bakr had an interest um, of interpreting dreams himself. So in the mornings, he um, would say to his companions, if some of you among you has seen a good dream, then let him relate it to us. The dreams of righteous people, Abu Bakr, um, believed frequently imparted good and true meanings. And it's related that he once said for a Muslim, particularly one who performs ablution well, to see a good dream is more beloved to me than such and such. So Ibn Abbas reported that a man went to the messenger of Allah, Salalati Wasallam, and said, verily, last night I saw a dream. In it, a cloud was raining down, cooking fat and honey. And I watched people gather what was raining down with their hands. 
Some took a lot, others took only a little. Then a rope appeared, one that reached from the ground all the way up into the sky. I saw you take hold of it and climb up. Next, another man took hold of it and then it broke, but it was then rejoined again. So Abu Bakr said, oh, messenger of Allah, may my father be sacrificed for you. By Allah, will you grant me permission to interpret this dream? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, go ahead and interpret it. Abu Bakr said, as for the cloud, it's Islam. And that which was raining in terms of cooking fat and honey represented the Quran and its sweetness pouring down. Some were taking a lot from the Quran where others were only taking just a little. As for the rope it, uh, that was connected from the sky to the earth, it is the truth that which you are upon. So take hold of it and Allah raises you in ranking. Then after you, after your death, another man will take, take it and climb, uh, climb it. Then another man will take it and climb it. O Messenger of Allah, may my father be sacrificed for you and for me. Am I correct? And uh, or, or am I mistaken in my interpretation of this dream? So the Prophet Sallallahu said, you are correct regarding part of it and you are mistaken regarding part of it. And Abu Bakr said, then by Allah, will you inform me about the part regarding which I was mistaken? The Prophet Sallallahu said, do not swear and do not swear and I will, I will inform you. And so he goes and he tells him that um, what in terms of, the, of what it meant. So it says, despite the profound knowledge or perhaps more correctly, Abu Bakr carefully avoided speaking when he didn't know a particular answer to a question. And this is something, brothers and sisters, that sometimes we feel that we gotta know everything. Everybody, nobody knows everything, right? I ask people who I know are more knowledgeable, way more knowledgeable than myself. And even they say, well, hold on, I gotta go back and check with somebody about that. Okay, so Abu Bakr was very careful about not doing this. So it says that um, some one time somebody asked him a, a, about uh, what does Abba mean? This is a, a word that was used in the Quran, and this is in the 80th chapter, the 31st verse, and fruits and Abba. Um, and others attempted to interpret the word, but Abu Bakr didn't do that, who instead said, Verily, the speaking without knowledge is posturing. And what earth will carry me and what sky will give me shade if I say about a book of Allah that which I do not know. So he was very careful about um, not saying things in which he didn't know. So Alhamdulillah, we will end on that. Well, and to conclude, this is some uh, this is a dua that the Prophet ﷺ had taught Abu Bakr to say. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, teach me a supplication with which I can invoke Allah during my salah. The Prophet ﷺ responded, this is a very famous dua, and this is something he taught Abu Bakr. This is where it comes from. Saying, O oh Allah, verily I have wronged myself very frequently, and no one can forgive sins except for you. So forgive me with a forgiveness from yourself and have mercy upon a uh, uh, mercy on me. Verily, you are all forgiving and most merciful. Okay, so um, I want to see if we got another dua. So, a couple other duas that Abu Bakr used to say: Oh Allah, I ask you for complete blessings in all things, and I ask you to make me thankful for those blessings until you are pleased with me, and even after you have become uh, pleased with me. Okay. Oh Allah, this is the second one. Oh Allah, I ask you for that which is best for me in the end. Oh Allah, oh Allah, make the last thing you give me from goodness be your pleasure in the highest stations and gardens of bliss. The third door he would make, oh Allah, make the best of my life be the end of my life, the best of my deeds, the last of them, and the best of my days, the day upon which I will meet you. And the fourth dua he would make, if he heard anyone praise him, he would say, Oh Allah, you are more knowing, you are more knowledgeable regarding me than I am my, uh, about than my, I am myself. And I am more knowledgeable regarding myself than other people. Oh Allah, make me better than what they think about me. Forgive, forgive me for what for that which they don't know about me, and do not hold me accountable for that which they say about me. 
And alhamdulillah, we'll stop there, inshallah, and we'll open up the floor for any uh, questions. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, I hope you can hear me. Okay, one of the young brothers here from Twitch, he says, this is wonderful. It seems like everything is from them. He said, Sister Layla's always saying we should learn about the companions because whatever questions or concerns we have today, they addressed. He said, mm -hmm. listening to you, mashallah, he said, it is so true. He said, there's nothing we not encounter that they not encounter. Right. And he said, it seems like Abu Bakr was great ex example of good manners for us. Alhamdulillah. He said, thank you so much and keep these stories going. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, here's a question from one of the new Shahadas. This is Savannah. She said, um, so is this what's meant by As-Siddiq, the fact that his rulings and his verdicts were not in contradiction to the Hadith and Quran? No, As-Siddiq that's a term that he um that, that's a title that he was given by the prophet وسلم, it means that the the, the, uh, the trustworthy so he was someone whom um the, the, so he got this he got this nickname because of his unwavering um belief in what the prophet وسلم, was talking about you know what i mean this is this is something that um he, he got this title for so everybody started calling because the prophet Salaam, called him as Sadiq. He actually had a couple nicknames, but this one is the one that we know him by the most because this is something that the prophet Salaam, Salaam, referred to him um, the most uh, uh, for that nickname. So he became known as as that because of the situation when people tried to rattle his his faith and what the prophet Salaam, Salaam, was saying. He stuck to his guns and was and he made the statement like, look. If he told me something even more miraculous than what you're saying, I would believe him. So he ends up getting this this title um, from that particular. Um, so that's where that comes from. His nickname. Okay, a sister from D Live. She said, "Please don't think she's being funny." She said, mm -hmm. "But she really loves these companions." She said, "Any idea how he looked?" Is there any description so she can picture in her mind how he looked like we have of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Sunday was telling Um, you know what? I, I I'll give you um a brief thing um of things that I've heard over the years, but we know that he was somebody that wasn't like he wasn't real big in stature. He was thin um to the point where if. <laughs> Like I said, his azar, you would hang because he was thin. And um, if the terms of people don't know, azar is like a waist wrapping. Um, I would say uh, a lot of brothers from Malaysia, they, they wear those, a, a lot of them. They, and I want to say Pakistan sometimes, they wear them too. But sometimes when you're real thin, you know, it has a tendency to hang and it might, you might, it might not be even. You know what I mean? So... What happens is that uh, I, I've I've heard some things about he was he kind of favored the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a little bit and he had a beard and so on and so forth. But as far as like getting a major description, inshallah, that's something that I'll look up and I can get back inshallah next week. Okay, here's a comment from another person from D Live. They say, I am with the others. Please continue this. Even after him, Umar, Ready Allahu Anha, and the others. We'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Okay, here's another comment. 
uh, a sister here wants to know why is it that these others do not go into the details? She said, MashaAllah, thank you for going into details of their lives. Alhamdulillah. You know, uh, as, a, as a somewhat of a disclaimer, um, for those who don't know, um, I have, a, um, I have a, a degree in uh, elementary education. So, and I love for history. And my mother was a teacher and she was a teacher for 36 years. So um, I, I kind of have the, a little bit of the advantage of what would be, what, what would interest people and catch their attention. And I do know that going in detail and trying to relate some of these stories to our, per, our lives is something that would kind of resonate with people a little bit more, you know? So, um, and, and, and I think too, sometimes when we have our, uh, some of our brothers from, uh, some of our brothers or whatever, from other cultures, um, even though I think that they've been here for a while, it's still, um, there, there's still certain things that they don't really understand about what we go through in this in the country. I remember I used an example. I don't know the person who just asked me this question. I don't know if they live here in America or not. But one time I used a, an example about the Aus and the Khazraj. And I used the term Bloods and Crips. And everybody immediately got that reference. <laughs> immediately they got that reference and appreciated it. You know, and alhamdulillah. Um, so I try to what I try to do is I try to um, I know I know history, I know how to tell it, alhamdulillah, and I have an advantage because I had, we would sit at the dinner table and talk about this stuff, you know, about all kinds of different, all kinds of different history. And um, and this is the stuff we were raised on. So alhamdulillah, I try to relate things in a manner which would be relatable to everybody um, when I use some of these examples and what I think would be more relatable for them to really grasp the concept of what we'll be talking about. Okay, brother Aki says you and sister Layla so much alike. I say <laughs> yes, we were his mother was my first teacher. History, my degree is in history too. Like he said, we were raised on this. <laughs> so that's yeah. why we're saying with this. It's important. You have to know that history. <laughs> we come from the same upbringing too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole nother that's a whole nother lecture exactly <laughs> and your brother isa yep isa too he's the same all of us <laughs> alhamdulillah yeah yeah alhamdulillah okay zoom this is all i have from uh d live and and the others y'all got anything go ahead zoom if y'all have questions i'm sorry and I know Sabrine, let me get her mic because she's having a problem with her mic. Go ahead, Sabrine. I'm a, I, I unmuted you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Jazakallah. Karen, brother. I'm doing I'm, I, as always, I'm very grateful to Allah for sending, I feel for sending you with, with this knowledge. This, And I love history too. I loved it as a child. And uh, there's so much good in it. I, I would recommend it for any any parent that was raising children to make sure that they know their history, that they know history. Right. Because it's very important. I've learned so much from just listening to you. And I've been listening to you for longer than you may think. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm Diva. And, um, I'm, I'm blessed to have learned so much about Abu Bakr, too, because at first I didn't really hear that much uh, uh, about him except for the beginning, you know, what, what we all knew from the beginning when, when Islam when first started, uh, Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were very, very close. And when I see his character, I think of of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Even though he wasn't wasn't a prophet, Abu Bakr wasn't a prophet. He learned so much, and he was he I, uh, he learned so much just from being around right. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, right, that's right. 
And I'm grateful, truly grateful. Alhamdulillah. 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 Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, <laughs> I just had some visitors here. They just left. Um, but one sister, because I know a lot of, especially with the Bantu community, they get so confused. When it comes to like saying you can't be alone with a you know non mahara man, even if that's mm -hmm. your ex, does that include like you know how you still have to be with another person or you know someone else or in a crowded area or something like that? Mm -hmm. Um, some girls don't understand that. Like, but does that involve also the kids? Like, let's say the kids, he like if they're co-parenting or whatever, and then he comes to see the kids, is that fine or does that mean she or some other adult has to be with them in the room? As far as is she married to somebody? You saying they divorced? Like they got they like she's remarried to somebody? No. Oh, just about herself. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I I can only speak for what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, right? Um, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that you know, uh, if it relates a, a person being with a person by themselves, right, is not permissible for you. It's not it's not cool to do that. You know what I'm saying? If an individual I, I know situations of that that's set up like this and a person, if an individual comes, they want to see their children and stuff. The other person just leaves, you know, so if the person is there visiting their children and stuff like that, then a person gets up and they, you know, they go to the mall. They, you know, if they trust them in their house, you know, they go to the mall, you can spend time with your kids. I'm not there. And boom. And that's what it is. But. As far as acting like, you know, they like, cause some of those situations can turn a little interesting. <laughs> you know, just let me just keeping it all the way real. That some of them situations can turn interesting. It can open up a situation where somebody say something inappropriate. You know, if there's, a, you know, there's brothers who didn't necessarily want to get divorced, and they, you know, they want they wife, but they want the the ex wife back. Then they might open up the door to say something or do something. So the best thing to do is just not be a together, period, in, in a situation like that. Okay, yeah, that's what I figured too. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, you're welcome. Any other questions? Anything else? Okay, alhamdulillah. So inshallah, next week, we, uh, with Allah's permission, we'll be together. And I think we're, we're going to start kind of getting into the actual caliphate of Abu Bakr. So I think everybody has a good idea of his character and what he contributed while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, alive. And then now we get to see what he had to go through once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, had taken him. And once again, that if anything that came good from this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so any mistakes that was made is from myself and from shaitan, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for it. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa ashadu anna ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruku wa atubu alayk.